shared. There we go. And broadcast. Says, it, says it's recording. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. There and we, we are now live. And we should start to see people coming into the attendees. So welcome everybody who's starting to tune in. We are just a few minutes before six o'clock. Uh, we're gonna wait for everyone to uh, get into the webinar and then uh, we will get going. As folks are uh, tuning in, welcome. This is Art Work Art Economics. I think I spelled, yeah, it's spelled right. Um, for, we're going to get going in a few minutes, but we're just going to wait for the rest of our attendees to pop in. Um, if you wouldn't mind going to the chat room and just introducing yourself and letting us know what your artistic practice has been. Um, and then that way um, we all get to know who's on the call. Just make sure that uh, when you do um, type it in that in the two section, it says panelists and attendees, and then everyone um, can see your comments because I sent a note just to our panelists. So we do have about 28 registrants. We have about 14 on the call right now. So we'll just um, maybe just wait maybe one more minute. We are at 6.01 on my calendar or on my clock. Well, we are at 602, so I think we are going to get started. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in tonight to this uh, evening session of Artwork, Art Economics with Cheryl Baxter, uh, owner of Mortar and Brick. Just to let everyone know, we are recording this evening session and we will be posting the link to this session uh, to YouTube and we will be emailing all of the registrants with the link later on this evening. Um, we are, we've now presented, I believe, uh, eight of these sessions on Zoom and uh, Tara can confirm. So we thank everyone who has been uh, joining us along since uh, May for the journey. And uh, I think we're gonna have a really exciting session. Tara has been going to introduce our speaker uh, just in a few moments. Uh, but first I would like to acknowledge that our session is being streamed from Lethbridge and we are situated on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains, and we pay respect to the Blackfoot people past, present, and future while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to land, and that the city of Lethbridge is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Uh, so tonight's session, we will do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, Tara will provide a bit of in introduction. We will have our presentation. Uh, throughout our presentation, uh, Cheryl will be accepting questions. So if you do have questions, please enter them in the Q&A box or the chat box. And as they do come up, I will find an opportunity uh, to interrupt uh, or at the, when Cheryl's finished with her thought, we will ask the question and she will be able to answer that. Um, sorry, and I guess I forgot introductions myself. So I'm Dawn Lighty. I'm the Community Relations Manager with the Allied Arts Council. Tara's on the call and she is the Projects and Membership Manager with um, Allied Arts Council as well. And Tara will introduce uh, Cheryl, our presenter. 
so after we do the presentation in our Q&A, there will just be a little bit of a final wrap up um, and uh, closing for the session. And uh, so if, if you haven't already done so, please introduce yourself in the chat box. Uh, please let us know who you are and what your practice is. I see a lot of folks have already entered their information. Just make sure that the two is including the panelists and the attendees. Otherwise, it's just going to go to the three of us who are on the panelists. Uh, and that's where you can add your uh, questions for Cheryl, or you can use the Q&A module, and I'll be following both of those. Um, I'm just going through my notes here, and I think we are now on to Tara. So Tara is going to walk us through a few, uh, some information here. So take it away, Tara. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tara. As Dawn mentioned, I work for the Allied Arts Council here in Lethbridge. I'm the project's and membership manager. The Allied Arts Council has been in, operating in Lethbridge for 61 years, which is pretty uh, amazing. Uh, our primary purpose is to promote the arts, improve community, and we also advocate for the arts. As well, we manage a large community arts center in downtown Lethbridge, where we have a, a robust education and gallery program. We also run a fine arts and craft store on 7th Street in downtown Lethbridge. And as well, we, we create many uh, sort of opportunities for artists. We uh, do art stays and we are doing our upcoming Christmas at the Casa event. Um, so uh, we are really, uh, you know, a place, uh, a place of expertise uh, regarding the arts in Lethbridge and in Southern Alberta. Um, we, again, as I mentioned, we're a membership-based organization. Uh, membership for artists is $25 a year. Uh, if you would like to become a member, you can certainly contact me, and I would love to have you become a member. I think right now it's really important uh, that we see the support for our sort of organizations and we're able to advocate for artists in our community. Um, I just wanted to tell you about our upcoming event, Christmas at CASA. Uh, it is, uh, we're taking it online this year because of the global pandemic. Uh, it's normally a very successful event. We had over 4,000 people through the doors of CASA last year for the two-day Arts and Crafts Festival. Um, but this year we're going online. So we're going to be starting November 20th at noon, and we're going to run through to December 1st. So at the 12 days of Christmas, we have over 40 local artists with diverse practices, and uh, we really hope you will support the event by shopping local and supporting local artists. Uh, the website is uh, going to be www.christmasatcasa.ca, so I really hope you would consider um, checking us out over those uh, 12 days. That would be great. Uh, but right now, I'm going to be introducing Cyril who is tonight's presenter. Um, Cheryl, uh, after an early career as an educator, Cheryl studied design and metalsmithing at Alberta, Alberta College of Art and Design and holds degrees in both education and fine art. Uh, since, make, uh, moving to, since making Canmore her home in 2000, Cheryl has developed the Elevation Gallery, employing her passion for original art and fine craft. Cheryl promotes the incredible breadth of talent that this country has to offer. The gallery adheres to a vision of exposing innovative work with few boundaries on media or scale. The gallery and its partnership initiatives offer opportunities for both well-established and completely emerging artists to develop their professional practice. And Cheryl is also the owner of Mortar and Brick here in Lethbridge a, a beautiful commercial art gallery in downtown Lethbridge, just two doors down from us on 7th Street in downtown Lethbridge. Uh, it is a beautiful gallery and event space that is available to rent. But now I'll pass it off to uh, Cheryl. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Don. Thank you, uh, Tara. I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm really um, I'm so impressed by all that Allied Arts Council has to offer on an ongoing basis. But nothing is more important than professional development right now. So I'm feeling pretty lucky to have a little bit of a voice. I wanna first, before I go into who I actually am, I just wanna talk about what, I, what I'm what i intending to present. So the economy of art's a little misleading. Um, I'm, I wanna talk about uh, the broader economy. I think we get caught in the microcosm of our own economy and we miss that there are opportunities 
well beyond exactly where we are at that moment. And so just talking about some, some ideas about different practices and, and what people have experienced in, in the broader Canadian economy, I won't go much beyond that. But uh, I think I want everybody to know that first of all, my skill is as an observer. I have 25 years as a gallerist, 30 years as an artist total. And I'm a great observer of people. That is that is my skill set. I am in no way an economist. I don't even, I, I couldn't even claim for a moment to have anything, I, I'm in the antithesis of that. But what I do, I am is a good observer and recorder of what's going on around me um, through just kind of being empathetic. So I'll go on to the next slide just to tell you a bit about who I am. Uh, I am an artist first. So. I actually did a teaching degree, uh, didn't love te teaching, so moved quickly into art school and became a goldsmith. So I did a uh, couple of years at ACAD, now AUA, uh, as a metal in metalsmithing and then went on to do an apprenticeship as a goldsmith. So opened my first gallery as an atelier for my own work primarily and moved into art agency very unknowingly and very slowly. So it happened first in Nelson, British Columbia, moved from um, what was just my atelier to a much larger space to kind of what became a, a public gallery. It felt like a public gallery always. So just for pure love and support of the arts and a beautiful big space, I was actually, you know, practicing my own craft and that was my economy for at least the first five years. So I kind of fell into it inadvertently in many ways. Uh, I came up in an era of art school that has defined who I have become as an arts agent. Uh, they were moving away from practical skills base at that time, concept driven, concept driven, concept driven. There was a race to academize to, to all of those institutions. You know, the, the long-term instruction through, you know, incredible craftspeople, was kind of falling out of favor. The, the academy was, was kind of finding its way in necessarily in a lot of ways. And I just, there was, there was no mention of how I was gonna leave there and ever make a living <laughs> or survive in the arts. And, and I defied it to some degree. I did as much as I could to defy it, but ultimately just had to walk away with my head down um, because, the talk of consuming arts was was absolutely taboo. So I went into it with that. Goldsmithing gave me a little bit of a, a license because it felt commodity. It felt like a product. And so I was able to kind of find a segue, not to commodify art, but to at least find an outlet that I knew that I could economize somehow. So I told you that the first slide, but what the qualities that prepare me to talk about this whole thing are, I have access, I have access to an incredibly lovely grown client base over 25 years um, who have informed everything I know about the public and their, um, their interaction with the arts. I've, I've been a good observer and I've collected that, those observations over years and it informs how I how I actually practice my own craft, which is now art agency. And I'm empathetic. So I, I feel what people are feeling. I feel that they're uncomfortable. I can, I can balance those things out. So it's become a study for me as much as it is a living and a support for people who don't have those access points. Mostly artists in their incredible studio practices they just, there's no reference point. There's nobody to tell people what's going on out in the rest of the world. And so I feel like that's maybe the role going forward, who knows, but I, I've, I've come along in my practice and my galleries with some of the same artists from the very beginning of their careers and the beginning of my career all the way through 20 years to see their careers as, you know, as professional artists flourish. And so I, I kind of, I feel like that informs a lot of what you're going to hear tonight. I was very careful, just so you know, as we proceed to the case studies, 
to not include any of the artists I represent. So nobody could be identified. These, these funny little non-scientific uh, surveys that I put out actually include some fairly personal um, financial information about people's practices and nobody wants to be identified with that or for that. What I, I did it for a very clear reason. I really wanted people to understand that every practice is different your needs and wants are different as you go along. Um, but, but to say that the, that kind of poor artist, the, the, that, that role is all there is, is a fallacy. And I don't say that the arts are funded appropriately. I don't think that artists are paid as they should be. Don't mistake what I'm saying, but what I am saying is if you have some really clear and concise kind of skills, you can move through it and find uh, an economic uh, an economic balance that might serve you to continue your practice for the duration. And that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in artists finding a way to sustain their practice through all the wacky highs and lows, the ebbs and flows that we're all going through right now. So moving on. Uh, this is one I say over and over again. I, I struggle. There's uh, and and I have no preference, or there's 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 no enemy at either end of the spectrum. But the the spectrum of academic, academized art, right on through to you know incredibly um, manufactured art. The spectrum is so vast, and. There are parts of that that I want to comment on across the board, but I want to say over and over again, you don't have to be poor to be substantial, but you don't have to compromise your vision, your unique vision to be financial, financially sustainable. So I want to go through some of those things really quickly for you. The, be aware and be definite of what you want. Because so many people are influenced and you're, you know, you pull off the, the road a million times because someone tells you you're doing it wrong or someone tells you you're not, you're not being substantial enough or you're not, or somebody tells you you're being too commercial, whatever it is, you pull off in all of these directions. And, and sometimes those sidelines are generative. Sometimes that is, you know, professional development, but sometimes it can be a sideline for your confidence and uh, for the substantiation of your practice. So I, I always tell people to try to really be aware of who you are, what your what the intention is. You know, if research is your intention, sharing your research, if a sustainable practice and, and a constant income is what you're looking for, know that. If you want exhibition, you know, public exhibition, if you want to be part of that realm, you, there's some very definite paths in finding that peer recognition, teaching, whatever it is. So choose your path and your allies in that path carefully. Don't be afraid to change course really quickly if it isn't working. If you get into something in, in the realm that you're choosing and it doesn't feel right, as artists, you have to be intuitive and, and creative enough to make the pivot quickly and get, get onto the right path. Because unfortunately, this, choice economically is not padded for a lot of mistakes. And that's what I have learned deeply for myself and for some, a lot of the artists I represent, you know, taking too many side tracks and sidelines, unfortunately it, it's not economically rewarded enough from the beginning to, to give you too much latitude to do that. You know, market conditions, a lot of my experience with the artists I represent is that, of course, they should be in their studio practice, focused on what they're doing, focused on the, the creativity, the part that, that defines why they're even doing what they're doing. But being aware of the market, the political conditions around you that affect the arts economy is, is important. So as much as, you know, a small kind of entrance into professional development, a little spot every once in a while where you, you connect with what's going on in the arts economy is, is pretty important in the big picture. I'm running through these really fast. So if there's questions, just let me know. Um, 
knowing your target viewer consumer market not just by statistics and and that's by experience so when i say experience i don't say you have to get out there and sit with your work all the time or you don't have to sit in a gallery you don't have to do those things but the experience any experience that you cross over with what what the the, the general public and i use that really carefully what the public perceives of what you're doing is it is good experience it's it sometimes it's hard sometimes it's hard to hear what the general public think of what you're doing but it's important information and to take that into your practice as not to inform that you shift or change anything absolutely the opposite but that you either redefine for yourself why you're doing what you're doing or you redefine your target market and if if marketing and selling work is your path if that is uh, your intention, then that's it's important to redefine your market quickly. There's no time template. I say it over and over again. I wish that all the business five year business plan templates that are out there on on the market would apply to creative culture, but they don't. And it doesn't matter how much we try. You can't fit your business plan into it because the pivots that are required as you know, people's perception of arts and culture changes are so fear, fast and furious that a five-year business plan just doesn't, but you do create a plan. You have to create a plan based on the information you have now and then shift it and change it according to what's going on and, uh, you know, what, what your needs, as your needs change, you know, moving forward. Your work is gonna change so drastically over the years that you really have to be flexible enough. So sticking to a business plan and saying, this is the only way I'm going to do it, I think will hinder you deeply. This is just my opinion, remember. So on to the next slide. Um, all right, who is the consumer? Uh, so I group people very carefully <laughs> in my mind when I meet them and I meet a lot of people sometimes over the course of a weekend in this in this current iteration of my career meaning i have the gallery in lethbridge i have a gallery in camor i'll meet between two and four hundred interested people in the course of a two-day weekend from saturday morning to sunday night so that's a lot of people it's a lot of people to talk to it's a lot of information that i have come to learn how to bring it, take in, even if I don't like it. <laughs> um, roughly, I group people this way, and this is just me. So my interpretations of this, I don't want to offend anyone, be really careful not to. Patrons, patrons are a very specific group. Um, the, there's a competent consumer, there's a, that's a, a kind of a studied consumer. There's an underconfident consumer, meaning the beginning of their path, they're just kind of working it through, working their way in to that realm. And they're willing to walk into a gallery and engage in conversation about art, but carefully. And there's the dismisser and the dismisser is also a challenge. Dismissers are, are they, they, they seem, or they present as if they're happening upon art you know, inadvertently and that they're able to dismiss it outright. But unfortunately for them, <laughs> I rarely accept that. And I feel like nothing is accidental. I think they walk in with a purpose. If it's to disprove something, dismiss something, whatever it is, it's an opportunity. It's not an opportunity to create a buyer. I don't ever delude myself, but it's an opportunity to engage. And Whatever that engagement means in the long run, I've seen miracles happen in that opportunity. Um, the majority of the general public, I'm sure it's no surprise to anybody that every, you know, people are out there working from a sustenance living perspective, whatever their socio and economic station. So they, you know, we are trained for good times and bad. Sustenance living perspective we're trained to kind of default to that if things are tough or if things are frightening or whatever it is. Arts and music and performance is, is viewed as luxury in those times. So 
people default to it. Sometimes in times of great kind of luxury, people will for a moment entertain the idea that, that there's more to that. But, but ultimately they default back to it's a luxury and whether they decide that they are going to participate, whether they decide that, that they have the right, it's aspirational, it's gradual. And that first experience, that one first moment, whether it happened when they were a child, whether that happens now, doesn't matter if it happens in schools, which I, I'm thrilled with that happening in schools now, but it, if they're invited to engage, that experience is the defining one. One experience became, becomes the reference point. So if it's alienating, if it's engaging, it's life-changing because it's, a, it's an ongoing access point where they don't feel daunted. They don't feel daunted because nobody is going to give them a test about what they know about the history of, of art or the history of music or dance. Nobody is going to test them. It's, it's, it's a discussion point. It's a, it's a, it's a drop-off point. And I jokingly refer to commercial galleries and, and opportunities that are in the more retail and public realm, and I'll bring that up later, as being the gateway drug, the, the gateway opportunity into the arts because one begets the next, begets the next. And soon you find people who have no, they're not daunted in the least, going from completely have never engaged with the arts, have never walked into an art gallery to reasonably undaunted walking into a major museum. So, I feel like that's a win. I feel like there's a role everybody has to play along the way. My story at the very end of the presentation is all about the, the roles that everyone has to play. The academy, um, the concept driven artists, the performance artists, the, all of it, you know, dance, music, it all plays a role in support for the broader cultural economy. And that interests me more than anything. I think I think you know people's want or level of engagement is pretty vast and you can't expect everybody to care but you can certainly win constantly in slow increments a broader cross section of the public so it's next slide I talk about the patron because it's an important thing to understand that people who are the patrons of the arts the the true patron of the art I, call, I say post-commodity, my husband would kill me for using that term, but I do. They're beyond the financial and the time and the educational constraints, meaning maybe not that they have a ton of money, but they're beyond concern over you know, being financially lacking. They have the time, they have the edu there's no educational constraints, they, they're versed, whether it's from, you know, being, being in families, intergenerational, kind of uh, exposure to the arts, um, but through connection, through money, through the academy, they have a, a, a constant and over generations engagement for the most part. And they want, they, they're tending toward broader philanthropy. So they, their interests are the advancement of the arts in a broader perspective, history, social societal impact. Um, I find that there's very few of those now left interested in the marketplace. So they invest, but they, they acquire for investment, for philanthropy. They're not interested in the, the more general marketplace in which a lot of career artists and a lot of studio artists reside. In general, they offer advocacy, political influence. Those are all important imperative roles in as we develop, particularly for public institution, for public initiative, it's important to be a lobbyist. It's important to have those lobbyists, to have those voices. Uh, it's a complicated relationship though. And my belief is that because, you know, from the outside viewing in, you have just even the word, the title patron of the arts, 
suggests, uh, yeah, <laughs> patronage suggests, patronizing suggests knowing more. And it, it's, a, it's a complicated relationship with patrons of the arts because they do have that societal inherent societal power and, and are able to influence the outcomes and you want that engagement is imperative. And at the same time, building, you know, respect from that contingent is, is imperative as well, because we want very much, I think, for the arts to find a certain level of autonomy and, and business acumen or recognition for business acumen. So it, I, I'm, I'm, I toy with both sides. I, you know, I'm not certainly on that, the patron side of things at this point. In terms of my own self, I, I have not reached that capacity and probably won't in my lifetime. It's, a, it's I admire many and I have many as, as great supporters of my gallery, but I don't consider that the client. So if that maybe qualifies it for you. Next slide. So who's the market consumer? That's the client. Um, so as I said, sustenance living people, it, this is a gross generalization and not for everybody. I just, I, I have to acknowledge that not everybody has time, energy and access to the money to, to entertain concepts of engagement in the arts. That said, many do. Developing access points that have nothing to do with consumer culture is one of the, the most admired, my most admired and impactful roles in the arts because you're constantly, you constantly have to be aware of how creating that access point redefines everything for in people's lives, changes their lives. Moderate living public though is a massive spectrum that that is somewhere in the center is a consumer in the consuming public. If that is your interest, I'm talking about consuming everything, consuming performance, theater, music, uh, and, and not just the visual arts. They're, they're not likely to seek big, huge commitments at first. So the spectrum is pretty vast. What I've experienced in my own career, and I, it is truly the most compelling part of my whole career, is that one first experience in some cases that, and I, I could actually, they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty decent numbers of cases where those first experiences, I've been standing there and we are now at a point in, in both the consumer's life and my career where their children, <laughs> where if they were, if they were, their first experience with the arts in general was, you know, before they had children, their children are now natural consumers. So it's that intergenerational aspect that's pretty damn thrilling to feel like that's the impact that you have. And that's through amazing artists and amazing compelling work. And, but it, it's, it's understanding that you actually have that power as artists to engage at, at such a level that you become part of people's lives for the duration and into the next generation. And then those people continue to support at sometimes broader, sometimes less levels, but, but you're creating constant touch points for the, the growth of the cultural sector. And, and whether they're buying something directly from you or having theater tickets or whatever, it doesn't matter. They are actually, uh, you know, they're, they're contributing to the larger cultural economy. So broadly held myths, you, go, you all know them. I mean, I'm not gonna, anybody who is, is uh, at all kind of has entertained any bit of a practice, um, knows that you know consumers are susceptible. So I'm going to start with consumers are susceptible. I'll go on to the myth. Um, easy access to everything. So conditions of society right now, <laughs> 
and have been for the last 25 years, easy access to everything, repetitive, man manufactured, everything. The products are cheap trend is, and trend setters and trend makers and people who are considered influencers have signaled the abandonment of individuality and originality. That's the condition we're living in. I'm seeing the trend is soft, beautiful trend toward us, you know, aspiring to through those conditions, people want originality. They want handmade. They want to be invited into originality of thought. They're savvy. They're savvier than they've ever been. And I sometimes fall behind. How do you want to participate in that? How, what, what is your responsibility as a, if a career artist is what you are, what is your responsibility in that? You have to, there's, a, there's an integrity that's inherent. And I'm not commenting on anybody's aesthetic. I will never. I wouldn't comment on what you produce, what market it appeals to, who it appeals to. What, I, what I'm commenting on is understanding that by, by creating a, a, a set of rules and integrity in your goals with that, you are, you're actually able to move what has become a societal trend to a new place and a place that's gonna sustain you and your peers for the long haul. And that's individuality of thought. Now new slide. So the conditions that are out there, not to be negative, but oh my goodness, what do I hear every day? Broadly held myths created by mass manufacturing, reproductive, qualities in, in society, readily accessible. So I joke about this all the time. If it's functional in any way, it'll be priced compared to something that Ikea makes, just so y'all know. <laughs> I, I, it, Ikea probably has ruined us all and given us all a lot too. If it is non-functional, there's an inherent belief that it's more valuable. If it's in a gallery, it's more legitimate. It's a myth. Uh, and therefore expensive, so prices are higher. Um, that your training in the arts automatically precludes any practical education in business that you might have. So feels like there was always a myth that there's a perception that one is mutually exclusive and they're not. Um, that your full-time practice is endlessly fun and lucky. So constant commentary something that I strive and work to try to dispel. It's not always fun. It requires a tremendous amount of work to be good at it. There is a professional standard, just like there is in every other profession. And that's something that you have to uphold. That's part of your pact with your choice of career profession. Uh, that the value of your work shouldn't follow other academic or economic principles. And, and that's something pricing work is, and pricing what you do if it's performance. There, everybody's always like talking about all the, the principles of the economy. If the economy is slow, then you should take less. And your job is fun. Why should you charge more? Those are all things that you have to, first, about, first of all, be aware that that's what the public in general feels or a certain segment of the public feel and and also have a have a genuine truth around that for yourself you don't have to defend yourself but you sure have to know how to balance that on the other side do you have to justify the value of your work based on your hourly wage <laughs> at a rate per hour always makes me laugh the you know without accounting for your your education where every other profession does that you know if you're a doctor or a lawyer you, and you've instead of as a lawyer you've just got a jd you've decided to go on and do a phd in law there's always accounting in in how you are paid for that and yet somehow in the arts that hasn't translated still and i still and all have to educate not condescendingly, but educate the public on that every single day. And so too, is it 
the, the professional and practicing artists responsibility to do the same. You're not desperate. <laughs> you have to tell people in, in the way that you maintain your practice that you're not going to be prey. And, and it's, I, I'm sensitive about that because it doesn't mean that people are all horrible, but there's these strange economic values around, you know, hitting the low guy on, <laughs> in, in trying to, trying to take advantage or have a, have a, a you know, a, a sense of superiority, a, a culture of superiority over people who maybe have less voice or less power in, in the economy. And I, I not only despise it, but I dispel it every day, every day. And at the mere mention of, of anything like that, I, can quote statistics and numbers for people, for my clients, for people who walk in with that mentality that, that I hope forever stops that conversation. Yeah, the, automatically tied to the broader economic. I think I said that. I think it's just about the fact that people go, oh, it's terrible times right now. So all artists must be starving. And it's fascinating because that is not the trend. The trend is that in times where the known economic um, anchors are not working, people turn to creative culture. And I have found that scarcity um, is, is not a, as much an issue during harder times as people think. So given this, this time we're in right now, and the, the shutdown time, you would be shocked by the support, by the, you know, and I, I, I reflect on it often with people that I think that the culturally supportive, the arts supportive public are building the Canada that they wanna see with their dollars right now. I think people are investing in artists and creators and creatives because they know that that inherently will serve the growth of our culture after all of this craziness is over. So that's just my opinion again. Uh, okay, next slide. Five case studies. Okay, here's my case studies. Very unscientific. I asked the same questions to them all. I sent it out to 20 people. I picked them specifically because I don't represent them and they are not easily associated with me. So they're just people that I really, really like and know, um, but not people that I have any business relationship with. And that was an important part of this. Um, no scientific, uh, there's no scientific anything to this. 20 went out, I got 11 back. I chose five to represent the broadest range of demographic practice and experience. Um, unfortunately, performers, performance artists, performers, musicians, I didn't have the same knowledgeable access to. So it doesn't really represent that group. And I see there's a couple of people on here that, that are in that realm. So I apologize to you now. No real extrapolations from it. It's just interesting to see the different practices that are out there to know that it's possible. Their choices, they may not be your choices. They're just interesting. Um, I think what's really compelling for me right here, right now, is you need to look beyond your geographical boundary. This is a microcosm, Lethbridge, Alberta. You need to look beyond that to really find a fulfilling practice. And as much as many of us don't have access to travel or whatever, I think you'll see in these little case studies, some really interesting experiences, people who are extremely rural in strange places, which is why I picked them, who have found a way, who can't travel actively, who can't, but they have found a way. So next slide. So there's so much information on here. Same questions each time though. So I'm gonna talk, to, talk, talk it through artist one, performative ephemeral technology-based practice. Um, downtown, large city, financial, you can probably guess it's Toronto. <laughs> Formal art education, yes. Six years still ongoing. 
but you go to school, you're, yes, you're doing ongoing training, yes. Uh, professional practice, 12 years, though five of it, it looks, you know, like this particular artist was, was not doing the same practice that they are now. So started in a different perspective. So these are answers that I actually just posted the exact answer. So if there's, if it doesn't sound like my voice, it's not. <laughs> um, so direct sales. So what I wanted them to reflect on is what percentage of your practice comes from selling art and what is from grants or from, you know, support from other entities. Um, so selling art in this case was less than 20% of this person's practice. Uh, self-managed entirely, no galleries involved. This whole percentage of your work time attributable to these functions, it was hilarious to look at because there was probably not one person that actually added up to 100%. <laughs> but this was my favorite one. Uh, lauding concept development and creation, which is interesting in itself, uh, a lot in grant writing and research. So you see the hefty kind of cont contribution that has to make. Dog walking was a big part of it, uh, where the economy came from. Total yearly income, gross sales, that means everything. So, you know, every performance, every gross sale, before you've paid anybody to have sold it or paid any of the costs of your practice, 28K, which, you know, who knows, that seems really low um, to me, but who knows? how that works one to three performances and a lot of drawings a year um you know the cost of the practice anywhere between 15 and 30k a year so you lost money do you feel you're properly con con compensated and actually the end answer in this one was a good one uh it was a stupid question <laughs> um so yeah it it, it this artist was great at being honest and straightforward. So we can move on to the next one. Uh, areas of the economy or the country do you live in? Prince Edward Island, so tiny, middle of nowhere, arts education, yes. So you can see all of the information that's there and, and the money that's sort of involved for people. I'm not gonna run through it all. There's some things I would like to point out sort of thing, you know, each slide to slide. And that's, you know, how, I'm surprised by how little, how, you know, is necessarily contributed to the concept development because there's just no time in, in running a business. So it is something you have to consider. It's something you have to consider when you decide that if you wanna go into that marketplace. You know, so, so think about it all. Think about what you're seeing in these slides and definitely feedback. I, I'd be interested in questions and feedback. I can't tell too much. People have different approaches to this. They either love what they're doing and money is not an issue. They either do it for entirely different purposes than the commercial economy. So I acknowledge it 100% and continue to. Next slide. This, this is a very, an interesting slide because it's a very high product, high yield practice. What that reflects, not sure. 85% of the income comes from sales. There's no grant writing, not a lot else in there. Um, that that has to do with you know out, outside of client base. There's there's very little else in there. Administration and finance, clients. That it's a very very much an industry based thing. Yeah, this one I love uh, because it's probably the most balanced of the practices that that I received back of the information that I received back. So. It represents high, what looks like high dollars, but in the end, maybe not so much. It represents a lot of um, really interesting public installation performance practice, but it also represents something that few people really understand that to, to kind of maintain a practice at that level, 
at that in in those kind of numbers this person actually has studio assistance has help um ongoing a lot of contractors involved it it is it's much more industry than you think so there's some interesting stuff in it i ask you all to extrapolate whatever you'd like from it but it's interesting information to have collected so the next slide yeah uh ceramics uh, you know this is a little bit more of a production uh, a production um, uh, practice. So just, again, interesting information. I am not gonna kind of go down and extrapolate everyone. The one thing that I thought was really interesting about this one is the reliance on paying other people to do the things that they do best versus really having to do everything in that was outside of creation themselves. And I think I admire that that quality about this practice. Uh, you know, marketing and social media, creating transport, tech, finance, all that stuff is, is contracted out. And that leaves a lot more time for the practice to have the integrity and the and the, the creation time that is sustaining and fulfilling. Next slide. What do we know? Um, I know that that now from an earlier age, there's more exposure to art and creative practice to schools and public institutions than there ever has been. I think those contact points are vast and it allows people a much broader perspective as they grow. It's fantastic. The internet era is fostering a new relationship between artists and the public. Um, that may be the end of the gallery, commercial gallery system. And I acknowledge that that's very possible and potentially a good thing. Um, there's a lot of learning to do about the public and, and what we what our relationship is. Galleries have always been gatekeepers and tone setters for those interactions. And I think, you know, we're just now learning how to get beyond that. Um, galleries have depended on the placement, the, you know, sort of status placement, installation style they're to direct the public on the value of work and i think we have to rethink that entire system if you don't want a gallery to represent you you've got to be tuned into a little bit of the science of that and and represent yourself the way you intend the consuming public's uh engagement with the arts tends to be based on the one unrepeatable experience for original you know i think that reinforces the value of originality um, if they re-enter the marketplace and realize that their experiences are, are being mass produced, they check out. And I've seen it repeatedly. So that's what I know. Next slide. Uh, yeah, all of these little piece of, pieces of advice, don't pander, don't relax your values, don't perpetuate the commodity and manufacturing mentality, try to contribute. Um, to your fields by constantly practicing original thought, copying all of those things without ongoing inquiry. And I, this is probably the summary of it all without ongoing inquiry and skill development, the professional practice isn't sustainable. I think tricks have worked for a while and we see it in these kind of vastly overpriced marketplaces where the tricks are working and briefly trend, all of those things, cleverness. Cleverness with the intention of superiority is divisive and diminishing. We need to stand together and include every element of the cultural economy in, in, in the broad kind of um, landscape so that we can help each other to sustain. Inviting public into process and concept in whatever ways you can. Consider the environment in which the, your art's presented. Uh, defy, <laughs> I say it carefully, but defy bad treatment of your work, defy bad lighting, terrible photography. You know, they're all little things that you can do to ensure that you are controlling the narrative around your work. Don't be afraid of technology or insulted by technology. So many people that I have 
this conversation with sort of feel like they there's a, there's a conversation in ignoring technology and unfortunately it that is not a luxury anybody can of, can afford at this point um next slide what does chocolate have to do with this? <laughs> so first I'm gonna actually, I'll, I'm gonna run through another list before I tell you the chocolate story just because it's my summary story. Uh, and I wanna get through it quick because it looks like time is running. Uh, tools to, to think about if you're interested in a professional and commercial practice, and I'm very careful again, I, I think I qualified this at the beginning. Value of social media, don't underestimate it. Um, things like, professional photo, strong emphasis on client list collection or, or, you know, interaction, consistent info campaigns, staying connected to your peers, watching websites for opportunities like Art Rubicon, FA, participating in peer critique, all of those things are lists of things that you can do. You know, there's small tools, there's stupid little things that you can do like room apps to present your work properly and pop-up shops, all that stuff is very commercial. But if you can, if you can utilize the tools that are inherent in our society today, you're better off in, you know, th there's, there's more there for you. But ultimately, don't isolate yourself in the practice so much so that you are, are, devoid of the information that you need to act and react. So participating in peer critique, I say it over and over again, that's an important one. The chocolate, what does the chocolate story have to do with this? I was talking to somebody about chocolate and how we all, because around, around Halloween, we all start talking about chocolate from childhood and it's the chocolate you get in the drugstore. You know, you get this chocolate bar and you think that's what chocolate is. And then the first time you taste great chocolate, you, you know, you, you realize, my God, what was I eating before? It's like, now this is what chocolate should taste like. And you, you try and fit the $5 chocolate bar into your budget and to your, your spectrum of what's, you know, reasonable and, and economically viable. And then if you can aspire to better chocolate, it just, it's that, it's the aspirational quality of experience. And that is my sense of the public moving through the arts economy and the cultural, the cultural landscape first and foremost, and the arts economy. So I think if you know that, and you present the opportunity in whatever way your practice allows, your the, 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 the broader service that you're doing to, to sustaining the economy in general um, will support your individual practice as well. I, that's as best and broad as I can be. The chocolate story was longer, but I've run out of time. So any, do I have questions at all? Trying to find my mute and my start video because <laughs> I've been moving my um, it's all uh, good. icons all over the place so that I can see what's on the screen. Uh, there does not appear to be any questions in the Q and A or the chat box. So okay. um, if anyone has any, if you can please enter uh, that now. Um, Elaine did comment that there's a great painting in the background. And <laughs> she was yeah. talking about yours because my it's her own. Yes, indeed. Right behind. <laughs> oh, it's her own. Oh, Elaine. Perfect. Uh, and is that, um, oh, yeah. So I guess we are at questions. Um, I thought that was a lot of information. That was really fantastic, Cheryl. Fantastic. I think um, there are some really great points that you, um, and I always get all these references wrong. You've, you've nailed the, you've hit the nail on the head. Is that right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and certainly as the Allied Arts Council, we talk a lot about the value of the arts and the economic impact. And it was really interesting to hear you speak about, um, we are all interconnected as an economic, uh, as, as an economy. And, yeah. um, you know, even just today in one of my other meetings, having the conversation about when did the arts become special interest? Because in fact, we are an economic sector and we are included in 
in Stats Canada when they're doing their their pieces around um, growth. Uh, nationally, we contribute $53 billion to the economy. Now, I know that also includes culture, and there is a little bit of sport. I think sport is included in there, but, it, or no, I think that 53 is just arts and culture. It's just arts um, and culture. I it's just it arts up. and culture. And, yeah. and, and we are not, um, and, and that, but that's interesting to hear you say that we're not always tied where people immediately say that we are tied. If things are, are down the drain, we don't have enough money to be able to support the other things in, in, in our world and the arts being always that first piece that we're told that is going to be cut. Um, so that I thought that was really interesting and I appreciated that insight. Um, so there is a question here. Um, so this individual follows three main streams of work. They've decided they need uh, want all three, but it's a challenge to shift focus among them. Yeah. Is this a good idea or should they narrow their practice? I think again, it's back to the intentions. And I think uh, there are, it's, it's important that your practice is as diverse as your, your creativity need be. And I think that if you need to separate portions of your practice for different needs, I think it's important to do so, but being too fragmented definitely is difficult. And in terms of, you know, your cultural vitality, your creative vitality, it is really a struggle to maintain three sort of streams mm -hmm. of work at any one time, shifting back and forth between them and, and re-engaging any one of those streams at any one time, really powerful, um, perspective shifter <laughs> to, to be able to shift gears. But my personal sense, just a personal sense is, you know, if you, if you cannot immerse in one thing because you have two different sets of needs from your practice, maybe sticking with two, <laughs> if I'm gonna give you some advice, three is hard to maintain for sure. But yeah, again, everybody has entirely different needs in their practice. Excellent. Uh, we have um, another question. So this person is a student. What are the first steps that they can take to start a professional career? So body of work, body of work, body of work, body of work, whatever that looks like for you. I, I think, you know, having seen a lot of kind of submissions around new, new work from artists or at every level in, in AFA granting and all of those things, I think, it, you have a, a, a substantial body of work without a specific um, intention is, is, is an important thing to at least identify your direction for whomever you're presenting to. So think about that. Think about a way of capturing um, that work so that it actually captures the quality and the and the uh, your you, the kind of broader intention, the individuality of your work, and I think so few people pay attention to how that work is then presented forward. It, it you know the the great photography, a, a great artist statement, an idea of who you are as an artist. Write and write and rewrite and look for some help in finding perspective on your artist statement. So as a student, the, the, those are the kind of key beginnings. Everything's going to change. Your artist statement is going to change. Your your images are going to change. But start with the quality of those two things and give yourself that it's it's a luxury of valuing your work that much. Great. Um, so Gary says that uh, he thinks that eventually a large number of people are forced to exit their regular art practice out of financial necessities. Yes. Are there some key ways we should be, we should work at to increase the value of art in the social conscience and help address this regrettable reality? Absolutely. And I, I, I addressed it almost solely commercially, Gary, and I, I understand that. But to those those important touch points are are imperative, and it it is things like you know children in grade one in, from the schools having access to um, 
not only just the museums and the art gallery and the com contemporary art galleries and the performances, but having access to someone to interpret the value of that for them at, at, at five. But what can we do now for the person who ha has to, you know, a, a kind of move out into another place to, to sustain themselves? It, it, it's redefining. You don't, re I, I maintain for every artist, you don't have to redefine your practice. You don't have to redo what, how you access people, but maybe rethink the portal a little bit because you know, going off to whatever it is that you're going to go do to sustain you instead of art is going to find no one any closer <laughs> to it. The, the dropout rate is, is really regrettable. And I don't think that governmentally, I don't think that societally we're, we're going to be able to broaden until people stay in and convince the private sector to support, support, support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Colleen asks if you have any suggestions of where to start as a photographer. They already have a large, uh, they already have a body of work. Yeah. Um, photographers have a unique challenge in the, their kind of association with the commercial world. So, you know, art photography particularly uh, there are there if if galleries are interesting for you at all, Colleen. I think there are galleries that specialize, and I think it's really important to not find your work surrounded by a million other media. Only because I think there's so much technique and technical knowledge involved in photography. There's a very dedicated public for that and they understand exactly the nuances of what they're looking at and the quality of what they're looking at, where in the broad public access to photography, everyone feels like an iPhone is a way of taking a photo. And unfortunately, it's been the way forever. There are a few amazing kind of access points for photographers, and there's some associations that I would suggest, and I'll type some things in at the end for you, for sure. Great, and then, uh, so it was Beth who asked the question about having the three different streams of work. Um, so she's just asking that she's here in Lethbridge and she was wondering if she can come see you and talk <laughs> about some specific questions. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> There's so many specific questions around that part of the practice and I realize I'm not addressing so much of, again, that performative multidisciplinary artist kind of practice. That's not my expertise and I make no, I make no uh, representations as such. I just know that unfortunately, you know, support across the board may be challenged in, in the, the time ahead. And we're all looking for other ways to find a direct access to the public. As I say, I think maybe the gallery model is on its way out and, and we are in an internet age where you know, we are uniquely tied together with the public in a way that we have never been before. So use that to your advantage. <laughs> well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions coming in the queue. Um, I hope it was helpful. I hope there was something was helpful in there. Great. Good. It was great. It was fantastic. Yeah, we have 20 folks on the call. I think this might be one of our highest uh, attended sessions. So thank you to everybody who who um, who attended. Um, and I don't think I see any other comments. It, a lot of thank yous. I think Cheryl, if you're able to tune into the chat box, there's lots of thanks and oh, folks great. who are just identifying um, there. We have quite the the, the mixture of um, discipline. Um, so I think at this point, I'm going to do the screen share again. And for those folks who did tune in late, uh, this was recorded and we will be sharing this on our YouTube channel. Um, so I'll be working on uploading that this evening and those who registered will receive a link tomorrow, uh, or sorry, this evening, they'll receive an email tonight with the link and any of the previous sessions that we have conducted over the last, um, six or seven or eight months now, 
they are all on our YouTube channel. You just have to search Allied Arts Council Lethbridge and you'll be able to find that. I'm gonna turn it back over to Tara uh, to do some wrap up pieces uh, before we finish off. Hi everybody, thank you so much, Cheryl. That was such useful and valuable information, especially right now. I think it was uh, one of our best sessions. Thank you so much. You. Uh, I just wanna remind everybody about Christmas at CASA. We are going online. It's gonna start at noon on November 20th and run through to December 1st. Uh, 12 days of Christmas with 40 amazing local uh, Southern Alberta artists. So please do uh, check us out at www.christmasatcasa.ca. And now on a personal note, uh, I would uh, like to thank Dawn Lighty. This is her last day with us at the Outlet Arts Council <laughs> after six years. And I would like to thank her so much for her contributions to our organization and how much I have enjoyed working with her on this artwork professional development series. Uh, her contribution has been significant and I know you will be successful wherever you go, Dawn. So I just want to thank you so much and wish you all the best. Thank so, you so much. <laughs> um, yeah. And if you consider becoming a member of the Allied Arts Council, everybody, being an artist member is $25. Uh, there's opportunities for businesses to be members as well. Uh, Mortar and Brick is a member of the Allied Arts Council, and it's a wonderful relationship, and we appreciate your support, Cheryl, uh, in that regards as well. So um, thank you, everybody, and uh, I think another great session. Oh, I want to remind everybody that in J we are not having a PD session in January, uh, sorry, December, but we will continue in January, and our first session will be with uh, Katie Bruce, our education manager uh, from CASA, and she's going to be speaking about residencies, residency opportunities, and why residencies are important for your artistic practice. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Excellent, and thank you. And just as a final note, uh, uh, if you are interested in um, membership information, you can find that at artsleftbridge.org. And all of our sessions have been free, but if you're interested in making a donation to the Allied Arts Council, you can also do that at artsleftbridge.org. And Tara's contact information is project at artsleftbridge.org if you have any questions. Uh, so with that, I think I'm just going to click over. I see two more comments in the chat and um, no questions. So thank you so much, Cheryl, for uh, tonight. It was fantastic. Thanks, Tara. Thanks, ladies. And Thanks, have Dawn. Have a good Dawn. night, Dawn. everybody, <laughs> tonight. Take care. Have a good night. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks. Good night. Thanks. You guys. Good night, everybody. Have a good evening.